Okay. Hello, everybody. Everybody ready to go again? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do want to say, finally, we've got our speakers in here. Two of them came in late last night, very late. We finally got them through. And then one of them is still trying to get in here this morning. And she speaks this afternoon. And they have, they have rerouted her flight so many times. And she called at 6.30, said, I'm in security line trying to get into the airport. She said, I hope I get on that plane. She's going to be in here at 11 o'clock. So she'll come in and just go on. But you can't fight the weather, you can't fight Mother Nature, and you can't find Dallas Airport. <laughs> I just kept thinking, I didn't want to have to start moving speakers around. So we're going to be fine now. Okay, now we're ready for the first speaker of the day is our new author, it's Karen Peebles. This is the first time she's done anything like this. <laughs> I told her, she's going to be fine. You're a very receptive audience. You don't kill anybody. <laughs> okay. Well, Karen Peebles has written a very interesting book on a kind of a strange and controversial subject. When I first read the manuscript, I was thinking, I don't know if, if this is going to be a good topic for our company or not. It's about suicide. And I thought that was going to be a downer. But when I read the book, it was so wonderful, and it has such valuable information in it. And it's a small book. The book's called The Other Side of Suicide. And Karen is, I don't want to insult you, she's as ordinary as anybody could be. You said uh, you're a mother with children. Mm -hmm. And when all of this was happening, her husband was dying. So, I mean, she's in the middle of a crisis, and this strange and unusual event happens. It's nothing she went looking for. You weren't expecting to do anything like this, were you? No. It just happened. So it shows you, you, don't, you, know, you can happen to anybody, these strange things. So I'm going to let her explain how it happened and talk about the book. It's the other side of suicide. Karen Peebles. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm really, really thrilled to be here today, and I'm really glad that all of you are here today. Um, I'm from a little town in Missouri called Lebanon, so we had about a two and a half hour drive, which was not too bad. I tried to work in a joke somewhere about the, the show me state, Missouri being the show me state, and I tried for about a week and nothing, so. <laughs> No joke there. Um, I know that suicide is an issue that not many people are able to talk about, and not many people are comfortable talking about it, but I'm pretty comfortable talking about it. And I've come here today to um, try to change the way that you think and feel about suicide, if that's possible. Maybe there's someone here today who's given thoughts to ending their life. That's possible. There are lots of people here today. Or maybe, um, there's someone here today who's lost a loved one to suicide. I hope to bring you some healing and some peace today, if that's possible. I'm really not much of a talker. I'm more of a listener, and friends of mine will tell you that that's a fault of mine, listening. I have a friend who calls me up in the middle of the night every few months, and he's usually drunk. And he wakes me from a sleep, and I answer the phone, and he says, Oh, good, Karen, you're awake. <laughs> and he says, Talk to me. Help me out. Life is not making sense to me. Say something that will help me. And I just put my head down on the pillow and close my eyes, and I just listen to him for about an hour or an hour and a half. And he talks and cries and tells me all of his problems, and... Later on in the middle of the night, he'll say, I don't know what you said, and I don't know what you did, but life is making sense to me, and thank you, and I don't have the heart to tell him that I didn't say a single word. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I just listen because th that's what I do. Um, like I said, I'm not much of a talker, and this is my first speech, my first time talking about suicide. It's um, probably ironic my telling you about that friend of mine that calls me. He was the first person to read my book on suicide and the first person to receive healing from that book. And while I would like to take credit for that healing, it's really not my credit to take because I didn't write the book. But I'd like to tell you about the man that did write the book because he deserves all of the credit for all of the wisdom in the book. I really did nothing more than write down what he told me to. 28 years ago, my Uncle George took his life. And we were not very close in life. I was a child and he was a lot older than I was. And we never connected in life. He would come to our house to visit when I was a little girl and he would embarrass me in front of my family and he would tease me. And I would wait in my room until I was sure he was long gone then I would come out. So we, we never connected in life. He was a loud, obnoxious truck driver, and I can't ever remember having a good visit with him. But I do want to say that he was a good man, and he was a good father and a good husband. I don't want to take that away from him. I just want to say that it's probably sad that we didn't get to know each other while he was alive. 28 years ago, he committed suicide and three years ago, he started talking to me. People ask me sometimes what it's like when someone who is dead starts talking to you. And I, I really want to say first that I'm not a medium or particularly special in any way at all. At the time that this started happening, I was a mother and a housewife and just living my life. And so this had never happened to me before. So when people ask what this is like when it starts happening, I say that it's shocking. It's very shocking and it's disrupting to a normal life. Three years ago, I was getting ready for bed one night, tucking myself in, and George started talking to me, and I recognized his voice immediately. I knew it was him. The first thing he said to me was that he wanted me to write a book about suicide. And I told him I did not want to do that, and I was not particularly happy to be hearing him. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll tell you what to write, and the only thing you'll have to do is write down what I say. And I said, no, I won't do that. He said, Karen, I've spent 25 years looking for someone who I could connect with, someone to bring this knowledge back that I have now, and you are that person I've been waiting for. And I said, I'm not that person, and I'm not going to do this. It's very hard to write a book, and it's really, really hard to get a book published. And he said, well, you write the book, and I will get it published. So I did what comes natural to me. I put my head down on the pillow and closed my eyes, and I just listened. So George started talking from probably 10 o'clock at night till long into the middle of the night. He just talked and talked, and I believe at one point he said something like, I'll just never shut up. And he didn't. He didn't shut up, and he hasn't shut up since that day. He began by telling me what first happens to suicide victims when they cross over from our world into the spirit world. He told me that these confused and hurting souls are enveloped in a cloud of nurturing and picked up by these high spirits and placed in a healing ward. He called this healing ward the Emerald City. And I said, why do you call it that? Why do you call this place the Emerald City? He said, go and get a notebook and a pen, and I'll satisfy your curiosity. So I got up about 3 in the morning and went and got a notebook and a pen, and I wrote down everything he had to say. It was just so beautiful that I couldn't say no. I told him I was not that person that he'd been waiting for and looking for, but I would write the book. The Emerald City, George told me, is a place of unparalleled opportunity and healing for the soul who has taken their life. 
The walls and the streets glow in various shades of green from all of the healing energies that are being exchanged there. The soul that finds himself placed in a healing room in the Emerald City undergoes a great transformation. Their character is completely rebuilt from the inside out and their broken spirit is healed. I've been absolutely fascinated by the Emerald City since he first told me about it. And I've asked him many questions about the healing city. I wanted to know first and foremost what takes place there, what the suicide victims go through, and what happens. Because sadly, I was brought up to believe that a person who takes their life cannot ever stand in the light of God. And I think that is a pretty common belief from talking to so many people about this. It's not a belief that's unique to my thinking. So I asked George if he could shed some light on this subject, and he was very willing to do so. You've been taught to believe that suicide is an unforgivable act, he said to me, but I will tell you this. Its very nature, because of its very nature, it warrants forgiveness and it deserves understanding. You've been told that the suicide victim is doomed by their actions, but I've seen no evidence of such. I have only seen nurturing in degrees that you could not understand. George asked me specifically if I would give this message to the families who have lost a loved one to suicide. Listen to me if you would end your grief early. Do not go to the graveyards to visit your loved ones. They are not there. Their spirit now walks the well-lit hallways of our Emerald City. Comforted and comforting, healing and being healed, learning and teaching, and receiving and giving great stores of understanding. Look to the heavens to speak to them now, not to the grave. Do not speak of them in a hushed tone or in a whisper, but raise your voices in celebration of their lives. <coughs> Too often, after someone takes their life, the act of suicide actually becomes who they were in life. That final act of suicide overshadows all of the accomplishments of that person's life. And as a society and a compassionate people, I think we must find newer, gentler ways of talking about this subject matter. We must find better ways of allowing people to remember their loved ones. There's this horrible stigma attached to the loved ones of a suicide victim that causes them to suffer a double loss. First, because they are separated from the person that they love, but this pain is multiplied because ever after they're made to feel as though they must speak of that person in a whisper. As an intelligent society, we should be able to find a way to change that. I do want to talk a little bit more about the Emerald City because to me it symbolizes a new hope for people the world over. To my knowledge, never before has this information come to us from the other side of suicide, telling us, fear not, the person who has taken their life is not in jeopardy. They are not in a place of torment, they are not being judged, you can relax now. They are receiving healing and forgiving, they are okay. These are new thoughts to me. They are comforting messages, and I believe this knowledge has the power to heal people and finally bring peace to their lives. I have come to believe that this healing city, or Emerald City as George calls it, is rest and regeneration for the souls who are exhausted for, from living. It is learning for souls who have lost their way and healing for an injured spirit. It is the place where opportunity presents itself to become what the soul always knew it could be in life. And once the soul has rested and learned and healed, there is further opportunity to, for that soul to go on and help to heal others. It is this great exchange or this give and take of energy that allows the city to glow green. The very first person that I shared this information with was that man I told you about who calls me in the middle of the night. The first time that we spoke, this man was a completely emotionally broken man. His fiance had just committed suicide a couple of days before I spoke to him. And this was a woman he was about to marry and begin a new life with. And he was just completely devastated. The information that I gave to him, the things I spoke to him about that George had said to me, these things did not fix him and the words did not make him whole again. But while we spoke, 
in between his sobbing and our speech, he said to me, you've given me some kind of hope, which I did not have before, and I think I can begin to heal now, which was really incredible. Um, this was the reason that George came to me and asked me to do this, to tell the world what happens to suicide victims and where they go and what transformation occurs for them. He wanted to bring hope to our suffering world. One of the other reasons that George came to me was to try and prevent suicide from occurring in the first place, if this were possible. He says that the prevention programs we have in place right now are absolutely not working, and I do have to agree with him. Um, the most enlightening thing that George has told me on this particular matter is that it seems to be, in almost all cases with people contemplating suicide, that the person in question fails to place a divider in their thinking between the problems of life and their life itself. And he said this is the root of the error in their thinking process where maybe they have a problem that seems insurmountable and after a time they think that the problem is their life itself. And he says that it's very important that, that they learn to place that divider and understand that we are pure spirits we are living out our lives and problems and calamities and tragedies are going to come into our lives, but we are not the problem and the problems are not us. There is a difference. Um, I wanna jump ahead for a minute and tell you a little bit about the relationship that developed between the two of us, George and I. Two weeks after we finished writing this book, my husband found out that he had terminal cancer and it took him very quickly. He died in only a few months. Looking back on that situation now, I would, I would consider the time frame that George came into my life to be divinely guided, happening just exactly when I needed it to happen for me. Um, during the time when my husband John was dying, George would come to me every day, bringing me wonderful messages of comfort and hope for me and for my children also. Sometimes when he was talking to me, he would get really, really excited and he would say, oh, Karen, these opportunities are just all around you, these wonderful opportunities. And I would say, what? <laughs> what opportunities? I, I, see, um, I see a tragedy occurring in my life and we're surrounded by sadness. And one day he yelled at me and he said, Karen, you are swimming in a sea of opportunities. I would not have described it that way. I would have said that I was drowning in a river of despair. He said, I will not let you waste this opportunity to discover, to discover that all of life, all of the problems in life are placed at our feet for growth and learning, and I will not let you throw that away. You are being witness to this incredible event. You are watching your husband cross the bridge that spans our two worlds. There are opportunities here all around you to teach your children about love and life and what you call death. George taught me two things in the three years that we've been speaking. One, that life and death are natural steps along this journey that we have all embarked upon. They are natural. And two, that death is only more of what we call life. George says that death is life. Replace the word death with life every time you speak of it, he said to me, and you will begin to unfold the mystery of what awaits you when your physical body expires. Death is just more of life, he says. I want to read something real quick that George said to me specifically about death that touched me very deeply and changed my life. I'm sorry to be reading it. I'd rather look out and speak to you, but I can't remember all of this without reading it. George said that death is just more of life, fresher versions of life, more beautiful varieties, far more delicate instruments of life, even more passionate, bolder means of life, brilliant methods, intricate pathways. He said, Karen, how I desire to strip from you your present understanding 
of death and replace your thoughts with a more fuller understanding. And I challenge you to let go of what you believe lies ahead of you and peer into this window. Death will not come to claim you. It does not exist. George says that death is life and that those people who have killed themselves are living still in this healing ward that he sometimes calls the Emerald City, that they are learning and living and helping others to do the same. This is a spectacular thought, for this is true. If this is true, it changes everything. It changes not only what we might believe happens to suicide victims when they die, but it changes what we might believe happens to us when we die. If death is only more of life, then we go on living. The spirit of my Uncle George originally came to me to ask this favor of me to bring this message of hope and comfort to the world. But as a byproduct of this communication, I have learned that what awaits all of us is another leg of this journey, more of life. I asked George to tell me something that would change my life. And he said to me, life is a tool. Your job is to decide how you will use this tool that is life, what you will use it for. Anyone can pick up a hammer, but it takes a master to build a thing of beauty with it. And it is the same with life. Anyone can accrue the tool of life, but it takes enormous courage to step back and say, what will I do with this tool? What will I do with this life? At the moment of your death, or what you call death, you will see that all of life was a tool and you will better understand how you could have used it. But if you want to change your life, pick up the tool now and wield it with purpose, not haphazardly and not on accident. When Dolores first asked me to come here and speak, I was told I'd have to speak for 40 minutes, which seemed really impossible. So I had this plan to write 20 minutes worth of material, and then I was going to speak really slowly. <laughs> but as I started writing and working on what I was going to say, I discovered that 40 minutes really is not enough time to say all of the things that I wanted to say. So because of this, I'm not really able to go into a lot of detail. I would love to spend another hour just talking about the Emerald City, because to me it's just a beautiful, hopeful place for these suicide victims. I would like to tell you about the hundreds of visits I've had with other family members who have died. I'd like to tell you some of the places that the spirits have taken me, but time will not allow that. Because of that, I'm working on writing other books. The, the book that George and I are working on now is about half written and it answers many questions for me about life and death, which is really incredible. Um, before I answer some questions, if you have questions, I just wanted to share with you one really beautiful message that George said to me, which also changed my life. Um, I asked George if he could share his observations with me since entering the spirit world, and he said this. I'll have to read this also. He said, I have thus far observed that there is perfection to the process of all of life, a perfection that is so subtle it is easily lost on the simplicity of the human mind, a perfection so great it is possibly not able to be discerned in the brief lifetime of man, and this process, this perfection is God. I have observed a harmony as wondrous as anything you could behold and no joy beyond measure from considering this harmony, which is the balance of all existence. Truly, though the greatest idea that has been made known to me since crossing the bridge is that joy, the most indescribable of joys, is our birthright and will reveal itself to you at that moment you have formerly called death. I would like to leave you with this thought today that death is life, I've come to believe this incredible thought, this hopeful thought that when we walk across the bridge that spans our worlds, 
we will find life of another kind, as George so eloquently put it, life of another kind, far more delicate instruments of life. Thank you so much. Okay, Karen, there was a few things I wanted you to touch on. One, you said that whenever the person committed suicide, the first thing they thought of was, I want to get back into the body. They regretted as soon as it happened, didn't they? Yes, I, I didn't have time to touch on everything but that I ahead. wanted just, to. Just touch on these few things. Good. Um, George said, when he, he, there's a whole chapter on how he's trying to prevent suicide from occurring in the first place. Uh, even though it's, it seemed to me at first that the Emerald City was such a beautiful place to go to, why not just end it all now and get to the Emerald City? And he said, no, you are not understanding the direction of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to prevent suicide from occurring in the first place. And in order to do that, he had mentioned that the very first thing that will occur after a person kills themselves is they will immediately try to get back in the human body. And he said, it's just so futile, futile because it's just not possible. And the person's regret will just be complete. But they are not able to come back no matter what they do. And there is, he mentioned a transition period before they get to the Emerald City, which is, he said that it was an incredible trial, a trying experience. And if there was a hell, he said this very brief transitional period could be hell to the spirit, but, but that it was very, very brief. And the transition period, he said that the, the spirit of the person who had taken their life is bound to their family and friends that they have left behind here, and that they are made to feel the emotions of their family and made to understand what they are going through and feeling, and that they are just so full of regret because of this. So the, the transition period, which he said even in, in our account of time is very, very brief, but it's very intense for the spirit. And then before they even knew it, that they were just embraced by these high spirits who are ready to heal them and nurture them and love them and, and bless them. and whatever it is that they do. Did I answer the question? There was another one too you were talking about. You wanted to experience the energy of the Emerald City, but he said it was too intense. You couldn't take it. Yes, I asked George over and over and over if he would take me to the Emerald City so that I could see what was occurring there, so I could better write about it. I would say, George, just take me there and let me witness it with my own eyes, if you'd please take me there. And he said, no, no, no. I, every time I would ask, he'd say, I cannot take you there because of the exchange of energy there. It would harm your body. It would be very harmful to you. But he said, there is a way that you can go through the whole gamut of emotion that the spirit is undergoing, but we will soften the experience for you. We will make it a gentler version of the experience for you. And he allowed me to go through everything a suicide victim goes through from the time that they commit suicide and long after they arrive at the Emerald City. And it was, it was very intense, even for me, even though it was softened for me, I could feel all of the emotions of my family members that as each of them were realizing I was not among the living anymore, I was made to feel their grief, their sorrow and their longing the physical, um, the physical separation from me for them. And it was very, very hard and very intense. And before I even knew it, there I was in the Emerald City. I, w I was placed into one of the healing rooms there and it was just magnificent. It was nothing that I expected. I expected a room with a bed and a chair and a television. <laughs> and he said, oh, Karen. <laughs> he said, it is nothing like you imagine. And I said, well, what is there to do? There's no gaming system here. <laughs> and he said, there is healing to do. There are new thought systems to adopt, new understandings to take on, and old understandings to shed off. 
and there is an expansion of the senses that occurs and you are ridding yourself of old senses that you are no, no longer in need of. So it was really an incredible thing. I was allowed to do that twice. And I still ask George all the time, please take me to the Emerald City. I think that one day he will say, all right, get your notebook and come on. But he has not said yes yet. Okay, I just have one more and then we can go to the audience. Talk about the children in the Emerald City. The children, um, immediately after the spirit is placed in a healing room, George said that children come to their aid bringing waves and waves of laughter. And he said this is the beginning of the healing process. And I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. He said something to the effect of pounded by the waves of their laughter like the shoreline is pounded by the sea, the spirit eventually softens and is ready for healing and uh, is ready for the potter to do his work, I think is how he said it. So the, the laughter of the children coming to surround these spirits is definitely a part of the healing process and I thought it was very beautiful. If anyone has any questions. All right, anybody have any questions? Oh, let's look Wait, okay, there. Um, I forgot my question. <laughs> oh, I know, the Emerald City. You talked about terminal illness, too, I mean, with your husband and everything. Do the terminally ill who have suffered a lot, do they go to the same Emerald City? I asked George that, and there's a very brief part in the book where I asked him that question, and he said, no, they are not in need of that type of healing, um, as well as um, s some people who have been ill for a very long time and decide to end their lives, some people who are in a situation that is out of their control, um, people who have been abused or, or in a very intense situation in life and just need to get out. He said it's very uncommon, but it does happen, and they do not need the type of healing that is provided at the Emerald City, and they just go on to enjoy other forms of life that are available to them. Um, you've uh, changed our minds about how we see suicide victims. What about those people, some of them that have spent time in prison for helping people who cannot make a transition that have made a decision that they want to? How about the people that help them? George said that people who assist in suicide are some of the kindest, gentlest people walking among us, that they are angels among us, and they are misunderstood. So it's, it's not wrong for them to help people? I asked him if it was wrong, and he said he would not say what is right and what is wrong, but he said it is society who dictates to us what is right or what is wrong, and he said cannot we make up our own minds about it? Can a thing just be what it is of itself without being right or wrong, and can we just accept it? I just wanted to tell you that I have a granddaughter in uh, Fresno, California, one in Aberdeen, Washington, and a daughter in Aberdeen, Washington, that are working as 911 dispatchers. And thank you for this book. It will help them very much. Thank you. You mentioned the um, grieving period that the deceased has experiences of the families grief? Can the families hold them back in any way? Does it, it doesn't affect their growth in the Emerald City, correct? The, the, the grief that. That, the, that the families experience. Yes. Does the grief hold them back? Yes. No, no. I don't believe in any way at all. They just hold themselves back, right? Yes. <laughs> Because I found that in my work, sometimes the grief does hold the departed back from going on if they stay around the person. I have but not heard that. But that's a natural death, you know. Maybe it's a difference between a natural one. He did not say anything about that. He just said that um, so quickly that, that the spirit can't even imagine and it's happening, so quickly they just go right on to their healing. 
It's, it's a offered to them and avail available to them very, very quickly. There's no limbo, as the church says. No purgatory, no limbo. George says he has seen no evidence of that at all. Hello. Hi. Um, my niece was pregnant and was on antidepressants and cold turkey off of them, so she committed suicide while she was pregnant. And um, uh, my concern or question was, what happened to that baby whose spirit was in her at that time? Well, that's different than a suicide. Yeah, she committed suicide while she was pregnant. Oh, she committed suicide while she was pregnant. I could not say. I don't have any information on that. I'm really sorry. Okay. I'm not familiar with what would happen in that situation. Okay. Maybe Dolores might uh, know. Yeah, because I've, ex I've explored that. It's two separate souls, remember. Yes. And the soul picks the parents to be born to. And so it made the decision. And it's not responsible for what the parent does. It has a separate life, and it will go on and find another um, body to be born into. Okay. So it's not condemned or anything in any right. way. Okay. But it's rather like she has a double loss there because you know, not more healing because she Oh, my sister is really like taking two lives. Yes. So she probably would have to spend more time there, I guess. Well, she did have some mental illness yeah. conditions and she felt like there was no way out because she's come to me since she's passed. Yeah, but there is not a way out, that's for sure. No, <laughs> there isn't. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't be more that's helpful. Okay. That's okay. okay. Let, let her. Oh, okay. Go. She just lost something. It's just more of a comment. Um, I had read Ruth Montgomery's book. Oh, I think it, I, the title "Life After Life," and where Arthur Ford, the trans medium, comes. <clears throat> She's at her typewriter one day, and her usual spirit guide was Fletcher. Well, he wasn't there. Uh, Arthur Ford steps in and says, "If you'd like to know what it's like after death, I'll, I'll help you. If you'll work with me, we can work together." And so it's a book, but it, he, she. It's thrilling to see the difference in the, pa the picture that Arthur Ford paints for Ruth Montgomery and you're painting for us. Totally different and, and much more positive. Like Arthur, just for did you ask me about if addictions go beyond the grave? No. Because Arthur Ford said to Ruth Montgomery, who smoked heavily, get rid of your cigarettes because it's horrible. You, you'll still want them when you're in the beyond, but you don't have a body to put it in. And alcoholics are the worst. They just jump to the next passing person to get back to their booze. He said, so get over it. But that, anyway, I was wondering if you had. But, that's but, yours is, you're, but other than that, he, his spirits languish, languish. And yours, your, the Emerald City is a wonderful coral, a correction to that. Thank you. Everything he's told me has been so positive, and I decided early on that if it wasn't positive, I didn't want to have any part in it. And fortunately, everything he has said to me has been beautiful, wonderful, and really helpful and positive. Thank you. Yeah, that's what with my book, too, Between Death and Life, I have found it to be beautiful and positive. And I've been lecturing on it to make, get rid of the fear of death and passing over. There is no hell. That's what I've found. There is no hell. Did he ever address, uh, like the woman two people ago, did he ever address what happens with the mentally ill who, who have disabilities to begin with and do commit suicide? No, um, kind, of fam kind of similar to the first question that in that some spirits who pass on from suicide are just not in need of what's being made available at the Emerald City. They're not injured spirits. They're not suffering spirits. And, and they just go on to other forms of life that are available. He said that there are billions and billions of forms of, forms of life available when we leave here. And if they're not need of, in need of that healing, they just go on to something else that they are in need of. Our, our army has apparently witnessed an increase in the rate of suicide among military personnel. And in fact, the paper yesterday reported that, uh, I think in May, that uh, uh, 
Uh, the Army lost more soldiers by suicide than, by com than in combat in both Iraq and Iran. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Well, I would say that what I had said earlier that George mentioned where people forget to place the divider between the problems of their life and their life itself, that, that is what's happening, um, that they are not able to lift themselves over the horizon of the problems that are occurring right now in their life and see that there is more around the corner for them. The problems seem insurmountable and, and they become their life. Because that's what I've found, that everything that happens in your life is a lesson. And you have programmed that. But sometimes you take on more than you can handle. Just like going to school, you take on more than classes than you need. And that may be what it is. They just get to the point they can't take it anymore over there, and they think that's the only way out. But everything in life is a lesson. And they just took on more than they could handle. And that's what I've heard, too, when they get to the other side, they understand that. Mm -hmm. That's why they're treated with great compassion. Okay. Yes, George says that these, these problems are opportunities, and the, the greater the problem, the greater the opportunity for us to learn and grow, but we don't always see that. When you look back on it, you can see it was a great lesson, but you get through it. <laughs> you, sp you spoke about the children in Emerald City, were they, did they commit suicide or were they just there to entertain? He spoke of them as high spirits. Um, all, almost all of the people or the spirits that are working there in the Emerald City, he has referred to them as being high spirits. So I would think they're not suicide victims. They're some, some kind of higher spirit. I, I never asked him where they came from, which would be interesting. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Well, I, like I was that. told that they're very advanced spirits because it takes a lot to work with that. They must have incredible patience. So it takes a lot. They're very highly evolved to be able to work with people with so many problems. Mm -hmm. So it's a special kind of a spirit. Mm -hmm. And then uh -huh. George did say that after a spirit is done healing, I asked him how long do they stay in the Emerald City? Are they there forever or indefinitely? And he said, no, they are there for however long it takes for them to heal. And then he said they go on after that to, he said they dedicate a certain amount of their time to either coming back to the earth and helping people who are thinking about ending their lives or they go on to offer healing to other, other people, other spirits. So that is a part of their healing also, helping others. Well, that's a complicated answer. Um, there were three things coinciding in my life all at the same time when he originally came to me. Um, first, he started speaking to me. That was the first thing. And the second event was that my husband was dying and we were caring for him in our home. And the third incident that was happening for me was I had picked up a book by Jess Stern. I think it was called The Power of Alpha Thinking. It was about alpha brainwave experimentation. And I started experimenting with the alpha state of mind, which is an alternative consciousness, the place where you can go in your mind. And it opened up a wonderful world to me where actually all of the spirits of members of my family, I'm able to go and see them and be with them and talk to them, which was really new to me because, like I say, I, I was really, really ordinary until all this happened, and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, when George comes to speak to me, I can hear him and I could recognize his voice as being distinctly him. But when I go to this place in my mind, to the alpha brainwave place that I go, I'm able to see him and be with him. And um, I'm in his presence and I'm able to hug him, which I have no recollection of him ever doing in life. He's never hugged me or kissed me or, or even a, just, it's really wonderful. Yes, and he said, see what transformation has occurred with me? 
who said, imagine what is happening for all the other suicide victims. This great transformation is occurring for them also. And he just said, it's so magnificent. When I go to see him, he's very young. I think he was 60 when he killed himself. And he looks about 30 now, 35. And he's just, he's not the same person. He's so different. He's wonderful and very wonderful. No, no, he wears his glasses and I don't understand that. Um, some of the books I've read talk about people who have committed suicide and they feel an obligation to come back later to readdress those issues and see if they can handle a different choice. Um, has George talked to you at all about needing to correct about some decisions? Well, basically, reincarnation to come back and face those issues again, possibly even more difficult. I think that possibly what we are doing is, is um, his attempt at that. Um, I've asked him specifically about reincarnation. In the first book, he said, I will not get drawn into the great debate on reincarnation. Um, but in the second book that we're writing now, he said, this is the right time for us to do that now. And he, he does say that reincarnation is, um, is a process, is a fact. Um, I don't know that I believe it. I told him, I don't believe everything you say, just because you're saying it to me. But he said, some things are true, whether you believe them or not. So he said that, yes, we do come back. We live more lives. I don't know. I've, I've got to decide that for myself. But I think that this book is his attempt at that, at, at writing things and making him a better person. But that's what I found, is they don't get out of it. They have to come back and learn the lesson because it's a school. And you do have to take that class over again. But it's after you get through the healing, then you're ready to come back and tackle it again. Mm -hmm. So if only they knew that, you're not getting out of anything. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Yeah, back here. Oh, let, me pass, let me pass the microphone back to you. You want me to answer that? Um, yes, would you? He's asking about people who are disabled and will, when they die, did they become whole again? Certainly. Oh, yes, I didn't hear Definitely. you correctly. That's what I hear, I can hear that. But this is only a physical body. This is just your suit of clothes you're wearing now. Oh, yes, I would like to answer that. I didn't understand you properly. I'm sorry. Well, it, that's why I wanted him to have the mic. The first, the first person that I ever had a visit with in that alpha place that I go in my mind was my grandfather, who was a diabetic and lost his legs to diabetes. And when the first time I saw him, he was sitting down at a table and he got up from the table and walked over to me and hugged me and um, I guess I always knew that you became whole again because you don't have the physical body, you, I guess you have a spiritual body now in the, in the likeness of your physical body but it was incredible to me to see that he was younger and he was whole again, he was completely healthy and um, probably for 35 years I had never known, to, known him to be in good health, he was in perfect health and the first time I saw my husband after he died, um, probably the last, the last three months before he died, he was not recognizable to me. He had lost 60 or 70 pounds, and from the chemotherapy, he had lost his hair, and he was really, really sick. But when I saw him again, he was, he was himself and whole, and, uh, which made me cry because he was just, just perfect. So I hope that helps. Right, any more questions? Oh, one back here. Can you, you want to come up or can you, sure. okay. Either one. 
Yeah, my mother committed suicide. Who did? My mother. Your mother? Committed suicide. And then afterward, when I saw her, which was almost immediately, um, she actually looked younger, much younger. But uh, I came to find out through guides or whatever information that I receive and the visions that I see that she went to school. She, and they told me that, that she would have to go to school for a very long time to get over all the emotional issues that caused her to take her life. Um, when I see her now, and always since her death, she comes from a long distance. So it's almost like listening to someone on a long distance telephone line. But with anybody else that has passed, I can see them clearly, I can hear them clearly. Not with her, except one time that was really funny. It was like a year and a half after she passed. And she came to me when I was working. It was like 2 a.m. in the morning. She was marrying a wet, wet hen. And she told me that my father had just asked this other woman that he was dating now to marry him. And she didn't approve of that woman, OK? <laughs> now, I had this knowledge at 2 a.m. That, that evening, at 7 p.m., my father calls me from a different state to tell me that he had asked his present wife to marry him. And I, there's no way I'm going to tell him what my mother had already told me. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. Well, well, that's what I found, too, that they have to be prepared because you can't come back right away or they'd be back in the same situation, the same mindset. So they have to get out of that before they're allowed to come back. And that does take a lot of healing. Okay, uh, is there any more questions? Because I think we're about out of time. See how fast it went? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the book.